So the last time we left at a point where we discussed fields, electric, electrostatic fields as one of the examples of field forces. And we agreed to start at distribution. Distribution of charges on bodies. Probably we can start by pointing out that any charged body is called a conductor. A conductor any charged body is called a conductor and therefore we want to find out if you have a conductor that is charged what influences the distribution of charges on that particular body and what actually dictates how the charges are going to, to be distributed on a conductor is what we call the shape of the conductor. The shape, the shape of the conductor dictates charge distribution on the surface of the conductor. Charge distribution on the surface of the conductor. Now, let us take into consideration different shapes of conductors and see how their shape is going to influence what we call distribution of charges. Remember we said that uh, charges could be either positive or negative depending on the material you used to charge your conductor. Now, I want to give you examples of different shapes of conductors and how the charge is going to be distributed on the body of those conductors. And number one, let us start with spherical conductors. Spherical conductors. And spherical conductors assume the shape of a sphere. They assume the shape of a sphere or what we are going to call a circle. Now, whether the charge is positive or negative, it is going to be evenly distributed on the surface of the conductor as shown in this diagram. Now, this is the case of positive, positive charge, positive charge. How about if the charge was negative? If we take the same shape, then we consider negative charges. What will happen is that the charges are going to be distributed evenly again on the surface of the conductor. Remember, we are saying on the surface of the conductor on and not inside the conductor. Now, let us look at cylindrical cylindrical conductors. Cylindrical conductors like this one. Again, 
charge is distributed evenly on the cylinder like that now let us look at a sharp conductor like this one a sharp conductor like this one and a sharp conductor on its surface the charge is going to be distributed in such a way that on the sharp point that is where we are going to have the highest density of charge like that whether positive or negative and the density is going to lessen as we move to the other parts of the conductors now clearly we have some sharp points on the conductor and the first one is this one you see the density of the charge is a bit dense the same case will apply where we have the sharp corners where we will expect the density of the charge to be equally high now <laughs> is what we call the hollow hollow conductors hollow conductors hollow conductors are like um, those ones that have holes so that now it is not a continuous conductor it has a hollow part no note that when a conductor has a hollow part we only concentrate on the outside charge is going to be concentrated on the outside of the conductor only inside inside the conductor there is not going to be charge at all. So, in case of a whole conductor, only the outside of the conductor will have charge. No. In case of magnets, we said that only magnetic materials are influenced by magnets. Now, in case of the static charges, not only the charged bodies will, in, will undergo the influence of these charges, but even the neutral conductors even the neutral the neutral means that they have equal number of positive and negative charge that way you cannot say that that conductor is positively or negatively charged because the charges in it cancel out now let us find out how then the effect of electrostatic comes in in case of a neutral conductor a neutral conductor neutral conductor and we have said that a neutral conductor contains equal number it contains equal number of 
positive and negative charges contains equal number of positive and negative charges like the one I'm drawing here You look at the distribution of the charges, you note that the number of positive charges and the number of negative charges is the same. So we cannot actually say that this conductor is charged because the effect of both charges is going to cancel each other. Rather, we will say this, this particular conductor is neutral. However, you recall, you recall the law of electrostatics and we say that like charges, like charges will repel while unlike charges attract. We said that like charges repel while well, unlike charges attract. And uh, uh, just a reminder, repulsion is an example of a push, while attraction is actually an example of a pull. Now then, what is the influence of an electrostatic charge or an electrostatic field for that matter on a neutral body? Effects of an electrostatic field on a neutral body. Now, having conceptualized the idea of electrostatic law, now, assume that this particular rod here is positively charged. This is a glass rod. A glass rod and this glass rod is positively charged. Now, bring it close to a neutral body. Bring it close to a neutral body. What will happen from the law of electrostatics is that like charges will be repelled, will be repelled and unlike charges will be attracted. Like charges will be repelled, while unlike charges will be attracted. Now, the result will be something like this. Remember, our rod is very positive. Then our neutral body will no longer be neutral, rather it will be divided because now there are some unlike charges that are going to be attracted. The unlike charges that are going to be attracted by the rod and equally there are some like charges that are going to be repelled. In our case, 
The charges that are unlike to these ones of the rod are the negative ones. So they will be attracted to this end. And on the far end, we will have the repelled positive charges. A situation that will take care of the law of electrostatics, which we said like charges repel while unlike charges attract. Now, let us take an example of a rod that is negatively charged. A rod that is negatively charged. This rod is negatively charged. We bring it close to our neutral body. Now, what will happen is that again, positive charges in our case it is good to point out that they are the unlike charges will be attracted to the side on the other hand negative negative charges will be repelled. It is also worth noting that the negative charges in this case are the like charges. What will result will be something like this. Where now, our body is no longer neutral as the positives will have been attracted towards one end and equally the negatives will have been repelled to the other end. Now, so far we have looked at the relationship that exists between these two fields, that is the electric, the electrostatic field and the magnetic field and even the laws thereof. Now, it is worth pointing out a few things before we go to the applications of the two fields I will want us to ask ourselves, should we have materials that we call magnetic? Should we have materials that we are calling uh, conductors? Can we make magnets? Can we make conductors in our own small laboratory? And the answer is yes. Therefore, I will want to look at methods methods of making magnets methods of making magnets and method methods of making magnets we basically have four and the first one is what we call the stroking method. Hammering. Method. Hammering method involves hammering
a magnetic material. in the north south direction that you will have a magnetic material then you will use a hammer and you will you will make sure it is placed in the north south direction and you hammer several times to make it acquire some magnetic characteristics. You make it acquire some magnetic characteristics. This is the north south direction and then you are using a hammer and you hammer it several times until it acquires some magnetic characteristic. However, it is worth noting that the magnet that you will have made using this method is very temporary and by that I mean that the magnetic characteristics that your magnetic material we have acquired will not last for long. Now, there is yet another method, method two, which is the electric method. Electric method. And this one will involve passing an electric current through a magnetic material that is placed in the north-south direction. You pass an electric current through a magnetic material placed in the in the north south direction. In the north-south direction. Note that we are insisting on the direction of placement of these particular magnetic materials. Reason being that the magnetic field of the earth is supposed to influence the effectiveness of the magnet that you are supposed to come up with. So it is good that you take care of the direction. Now, number three. Number three is what we call magnetization. Magnetization by contact. And this method is also called the induction method. And this involves 
making a magnetic material acquire magnetic characteristics by bringing it into contact with a permanent magnet by bringing it into contact with a permanent magnet like you would have a bar magnet bar magnet now the bar magnet the bar magnet you bring it into contact with a pin an office pin you would realize that this pin for as long as it is in contact with this a permanent magnet it can be able to attract another pin now that does not mean that your pin is a magnet in itself but the fact that it has come into contact with a permanent magnet it has acquired some temporary uh, magnetic characteristics which will enable it to attract another pin you want to look at that no i brought a pin into contact with the magnet and it is able to attract another pin immediately you detach it from the magnet it loses its magnetic characteristics like we said the methods we are discussing will help us to to come up with temporary magnets you detach it and the magnetic characteristics are lost that's something you can try at home detach it and see what happens the magnetic characteristics are lost now let us look at the last method of magnetization which i'm going to call the stroking method stroking method will involve it involves stroking a magnetic material stroking a magnetic material with a permanent a permanent magnet a permanent magnet is that which does not lose its magnetic characteristics then what happens is that the needle acquires some temporary magnetic characteristics just by stroking it with a permanent magnet now probably we can draw a diagram to show that this is a needle and then we stroke using a permanent magnet remember to indicate the poles this is a permanent permanent magnet i 
and this is a magnetic material. In our case, the needle. And by stroking several times, we have been able to demonstrate that we shall have a temporary magnet which whose uh, magnetic characteristics may not last for long. Now, it is worth noting the pole with which you stroke. produces, it actually produces an opposite pole at the end of the magnetic material. Material that is actually stroked last that the end of the magnetic material that is stroked last is the one that actually acquires a polarity that is opposite to that of the magnet that you are using to stroke. That the pole with which you stroke produces an opposite pole at the end of the magnetic material being stroked, being last what I mean is, like in our case, we have the needle. We have the needle. We use our permanent magnet again to stroke. Now, at the end that will be stroked last will be this one. And therefore, the polarity that will be acquired on this side will be the south polarity. We shift to the types, types of magnets, types of magnets, and in this case we are going to look at two two types. A are the permanent magnets. And permanent magnets are actually they are magnets whose magnetism is not lost. For example, we have been having the bar magnet, which is the most common of all. And the bar magnet is the one that we have been using, this one. It is an example of a permanent magnet. We have others like horseshoe, horseshoe, shoe magnet. A horseshoe magnet is this one that looks like the shoe of a horse. That one. This will be the north, this will be the south. That one is the horse shoe magnet. Now, another example is what we call the ring. The ring magnet. And just like the name suggests, the ring magnet looks like a ring, like that. That is a ring 
magnet. The other type of magnets that we have are the temporally. The temporally, we have the temporary magnets. And just like the name suggests, they are called temporary because they are magnet seam. Lasts for a very short, a very short time. An example is what we have just made by bringing a pin into contact with a permanent magnet and then using it to attract another pin you under, you you realize that the pin by virtue of being in contact with our permanent magnet in itself it behaves like a magnet but what happens when you detach it its magnetism is lost and thus it cannot hold the nail anymore. Now, another example is what we call an electro electromagnet. An electromagnet is that magnet that is made made by passing electric current through a magnetic material. A temporary magnet will be formed when you pass an electric current through a magnetic material and once you switch off your electric current you realize that the magnet will lose its magnetism. Now, how then can we destroy a magnet? Because we have looked at four methods that we can use to make a magnet. Now, suppose we want to destroy the same. We can have several methods. We can have several methods of demagnetization. Demagnetization simply means destroying a magnet. And one of them is stroking and stroking will result to destruction of a magnet if you do it in the east west direction that is why we insisted on the direction in which you hold your uh, magnetic material when you want to make a magnet so if you stroke Stroke a magnetic material in the east west direction, magnetism is going to be destroyed. Now, method number two is what we call hammering. Hammering, and again, also it involves hammering a magnetic material 
armoring a magnetic material in the east east west direction so how you hold your material when you're hammering it will determine whether you will make or destroy a magnet the third and the last method that we are going to look at is what we call the electric is the electric method and the electric method also will involve reversing reversing the current now in case you used a current in one direction you can reverse the terminals by reversing the terminals or alternatively you can also use alternating current you can use alternating current pass it through a magnetic material and you are sure to destroy the magnetism of that particular material now let us look at a few uses of magnets uses of magnets uses of magnets and number one is making compasses compasses like the ones you use in geography are made using magnets and they are basically there to show direction Another use is the making of telephone receivers. Telephone receivers. Loudspeakers. Loudspeakers. generators and electric motors generators and electric motors just to mention but a few we have seen that we can actually destroy magnetism and that is why we need to be very careful in the way we store our magnets. Therefore, let us discuss something. About storage of magnets. And basically, they are supposed to be stored in pairs in tools and with keepers across with keepers across the ends like this you store them in pairs
They are supposed to be stored in pairs and with keepers across the ends and a, a soft material at the, at the center. Opposite, opposite poles should be brought close together. Let us demonstrate that. That you should have you should have opposite poles brought together. A soft material at the center and this keep us across the poles. Different poles adjacent to each other, a soft material at the center and keep us across the ends. That is, different poles close to each other, a soft material at the center and the keepers across the poles. How about the electrostatic field? How do we apply it? Now, electrostatic, electrostatic fields Electrostatic fields also have an application and in our case we are going to mention the lightning, lightning arresters, lightning arresters. Right, lightning arresters are installed in our houses to prevent our houses from being from being stricken by lightning. Let us think about that word. Uh, so, having said that, let us look at yet another category of forces which we are going to call the scalar or the scalar and vector quantities. Scalar and vector quantities. A scalar is a quantity that has magnitude only. Magnitude is the size. It has the quantity that has magnitude. Magnitude in our case is also the size only magnitude only. Now, for example, if you consider the volume of a cylinder, for example, the volume of a cylinder is given by pi r squared h. Now, 
that is all you can say about the volume. Probably add units cubed. It only gives you the size of the volume of that cylinder and no other additional information about it. Now, examples. Examples of scalars are one, we can give the volume. Two, we can give the length. Three, you could talk about density. Four, you could talk about speed. Five, you can talk about area. You can also add time. And the list can continue. Now, these are just few examples of quantities you will work with under the category of scala. Now, how do we represent a scala on a diagram? Let us look at the diagrammatic representation of scalars. And a scala is represented using a line just a line and a number. Probably you can call this two centimeters. Now, two centimeters is supposed to show you that you are actually talking about a length and its size is two centimeters. Now, the length, the length of the line the length of the line gives the size of the scalar. The length is actually there to show you the size of the scalar. For example, if I would draw scalar A and another one, I call it B. The difference in the size of the lengths is supposed to give you an idea on the difference between the sizes of the scalars. Now, remember that all quantities should be represented using their correct SI units. Now, in our next lesson, we are going to discuss vectors and show how different they are from scalars and draw them dra diagrammatically. Thank you.